welcome back to Anne of Green Gables. We are doing chapter 25. going to tell you right now, we have some <clears throat> gentlemen fixing something. So if you hear banging and booming, it's in the hallway. We've got the door shut. All right, so this chapter is called Matthew Insists on Puffed Sleeves. Um, first word is a boot jack. Boot jack is a device used for pulling off boots. What? Um, so boot jack is a device. used for pulling off boots be taken to cause oneself to go be taken Gown is a woman's dress. Oh, Trifling is lacking in significance. No significance or solid worth. So, an example of this would be like a ring. Maybe you have co what's called costume jewelry, right? So maybe you have a ring that doesn't have a real gem in it, um, which would be different than your mom's diamond ring for her wedding band. So a trifling would be something that costs very little or it's not very valuable. Um, a diamond ring is really valuable, right? Conjugation <clears throat> is the capacity to think or reflect. Ingratingly. is intended okay just making sure they are in the intended or adopted in order to gain favor Flattering. Bangles. A stiff usually ornamented or ornamental, sorry. Bracelet or anklet slipped or collapsed on. Or, oh, sorry, slipped or clasped on. So sometimes you might see women a lot of times wearing several metal bracelets down their wrist. Those are bangles. Okay. Feebly. Feebly. 
markedly lacking in strength. Vane is a peacock. We are going to try to solve it together. You were not wrong. Um, shirings or shirings. It's a decorative gathering. Oh, shirings. A decorative gathering. Um, such as cloth. Ulster is a long, loose overcoat of Irish origin made of heavy materials oops sorry I can't see Encord is a demand for repetition repeat or reappearance made by an audience. So no, so in other words, if you go to like a choir, if you go to like a if you go to a concert and everybody stands up and screams and claps at the end and they won't stop until someone says and they won't stop until they the person comes back out and sings another song that's an encore it's a demand for repetition or reappearance made by an audience a lot of times they demand you say another something or do another something That's a solo. Encore means do it again. So in other words, if I if some if I was doing a piano recital and everybody was just so enamored with how I did with my playing the piano and they all stood up and whoop whooped and said encore encore, then I would need to have another musical piece to play encore do it again all right so you are on page 192 matthew insists on puff sleeves and again this is so good just so good i don't know there's so much the the problem with this particular book by ellen montgomery and she has other ones in the she has other ones other books you can read um, uh, the problem with it is, is she just, she's just such a good writer, right? And you just want to keep on reading and it's like, oh, this a chapter so good. And then I say it the next time. This is so good. And then I say it the next time. Matthew insists on puff sleeves. Matthew was having a bad 10 minutes of it. He had come into the kitchen in the twilight of a cold gray December evening and had sat down in the wood box corner to take off his heavy boots. Unconscious of the fact that Anne and a bevy, so a group of her schoolmates, were having a practice of the Fairy Queen in the sitting room. Presently they came trooping through the hall and out into the kitchen laughing and chattering gaily. So they're pretty happy. 
They did not see Matthew, who shrank bashfully back into the shadows beyond the wood box with a boot in one hand and a boot jack, which will help him take off his boots in the other one. And he watched them shyly for the aforesaid ten minutes as they put on their caps and jackets and talked about the dialogue and the concert. Anne stood among them bright-eyed and animated as they, but Matthew suddenly became conscious that there was something different about her, dif about her different from her mates. So there's something different about Anne than, it, than about her friends. And what worried Matthew was that the difference impressed him as being something that should not exist. Anne had a brighter face and a bigger, starrier eyes and the more delicate features than the others. Even shy, unobservant Matthew had learned to take note of these things. But the difference that disturbed him did not contain, consist in any of these respects. Then in what did it consist? Matthew was haunted by this question long after the girls had gone arm in arm down the long, hard, frozen lane and Anne had be taken to cause herself to, to go. She, she, go. she had went, her, took herself to her books. So her friends are on their way home, and Anne's going back to doing her schoolwork. I didn't say that, but I don't disagree. <clears throat> He could not refer it to Marilla, who he felt would be quite sure to sniff scornfully and remark that the only difference she saw between Anne and the other girls was that they sometimes kept their tongues quiet, while Anne never did. This, Matthew felt, would be of no great help. He had recourse to his pipe that evening to help him study it out, much to Marilla's disgust. Their brother and sister. So neither one of them married. So they just lived together. Well, wow. yeah. And Matthew is super shy, so that makes a lot of sense. You'll find out something else about Aunt or Marilla later on, which is kind of interesting juicy tidbit all right so back to the book he had recourse to his pipe that evening to help him study it out much to Marilla's disgust after two hours of smoking in hard reflection Matthew arrived at a solution of his problem Anne was not dressed like the other girls now we've already talked about this what kind of sleeves does Anne have they're not puff sleeves. And Marilla said, puff sleeves are a waste of material, right? And Anne wishes and wishes and wishes she had puff sleeves, but she doesn't have puff sleeves. The more Matthew thought about the matter, the more he was convinced that Anne had never been dressed like the other girls. Never since she'd come to Green Gables. Marilla kept her clothes in plain, dark dresses, all made from the same unvarying pattern. If Matthew knew there was such a thing as fashion and dress, it was as much as he did. But he was quite sure that Anne's sleeves did not look at all like the sleeves the other girls wore. He recalled the cluster of little girls he had seen around her that evening. All gay in waists of blue, red and blue and pink and white. And he wondered why Marilla always kept her so plainly and soberly gowned, or so plainly and soberly dressed. Of course, it must be all right. Marilla knew best, and Marilla was bringing her up. Probably some wise inscrut inscrutable motive was to be served thereby. But surely it would do no harm to let the child have one pretty dress, something like Diana Barry always war Matthew decided he would give her one that surely could not be objected to as an unwarranted putting in of his oar Christmas was only a fortnight or two weeks off 
A nice new dress would be the very thing for a present. Matthew, with a sigh of satisfaction, huh, put away his pipe and went to bed, while Marilla opened all the doors and aired out the house. Two weeks from now is Christmas. How cold is it? How cold do you think it probably is in Canada? Pretty cold. And she opens all the windows out up to get the smoke out of the house. <clears throat> and they don't have furnaces like we do. They have a wood stove. So it's really hot around the wood stove and not much farther out. The very next evening, Matthew betook himself to Carmody to buy the dress, determined to get the worst over and have done with it. It would be, he felt assured, no trifling, so it's not going to be any small ordeal. There were, were some things Matthew could buy and prove himself no mean bargainer. But he knew he would be at the mercy of shopkeepers when it came to buying a girl's dress. After much cognition, the capacity to think or reflect. So after thinking for a while, Matthew resolved to go to Samuel Lawson's store instead of William Blair's. To be sure, the Cuthberts had always gone to William Blair's. It was almost as much a matter of conscience with them to attend the Presbyterian Church and vote conservative. So, maybe your family always goes to Walmart. That's where you go. That's where you get your groceries. That's where you get everything. You always go to Walmart. Maybe your family always goes to Meyer. That's where you get your groceries. That's where you get everything. And you rarely go to the other store. So, that's what's going on with him. He, his family always goes to the William Blair store. But, he's going to go to Samuel Lawson's store instead. But William Blair's two daughters frequently waited on customers there, and Matthew held them in absolute dread. So remember, Matthew's still super shy, except for around Anne, right? And he doesn't like girls especially. He's just not, not like them, but he's just super shy with girls, right? So he is, doesn't want to run into a girl, so he's going to go to the other store. He could contrive to deal with them when he knew exactly what he wanted and could point it out. But in such a matter as this, requiring explanation and consultation, Matthew felt he must be sure of a man behind the counter. Who's going to be better at dealing with women's dresses, probably? Woman. Probably a woman. Woman. <clears throat> so he would go to Lawson's where Samuel or his son would wait on him. Alas, Matthew did not know that Samuel, in the recent expansion of his business, had set up a lady clerk also. She was a niece of his wife's and had a, and a very dashing young person indeed, with a huge drooping pompadour, that big hairstyle, big rolling brown eyes, and a moist, extensive, and bewildering smile. She was dressed with exceeding smartness and wore several bangle metal bracelets that glittered and rattled and tinkled with every movement of her hand. Matthew was covered with confusion at finding her there at all, and those bangles completely wrecked his wits at one fell swoop. What can I do for you this evening, Mr. Cuthbert? Miss Lucia, Lucy, yeah, Lucia, Harrison inquired briskly and uh, ingratingly, ingratingly, intending to adapt, intended or adapted in order to be, to gain favor. So she's trying to flatter him. Tapped the counter with both hands. Have you, <clears throat> have you any, 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 well now, say any garden rakes, stammered Matthew. Miss Harrison looked somewhat surprised, as she might, to hear a man inquiring for garden rakes in the middle of December. I believe we have one or two left over, she said, but they're upstairs in the lumber room. I'll go and see. During her absence, Matthew collected his scattered sons for another effort. When Miss Harrison returned with the rake and cheerfully inquired, Anything else tonight, Mr. Cuthbert? 
Matthew took his courage in both hands and replied, Well, now, since you suggested it, I might as well take, that is, look at, buy some hayseed. Miss Harris had heard Matthew Cuthbert called odd. She now concluded that he was entirely crazy. We only keep hayseed in the spring, she explained loftily. loftily. We've none on hand just now. Oh, certainly, certainly, J just as you say, stammered unhappy Matthew, seizing the rake and making for the door. At the threshold, he recollected that he had not paid for it, and he turned miserably back. While Miss Harris was counting out his change, he rallied his powers for a final desperate attempt. Well, now, if it isn't too much trouble, I might as well, that is, I'd like to look at some sugar. White or brown, queried Miss Harris patiently. Oh, well, now, brown, said Matthew feebly. Feebly means um, like he's weak, like, you know, I don't, I don't know. He's not, like, being assertive. He's just kind of, uh, I don't know. Okay, let's talk turkey for a hot second. How many people put white sugar on their cereal this morning? Did anybody use any regular sugar, the white sugar? Anybody use... You use white sugar on cereal or something this morning? Anybody use brown sugar on their cereal this morning? Uh, okay, so in the last week, raise your hand if you've used brown sugar. In the last week, raise your hand if you've used white sugar. How often do you use white sugar versus brown sugar? Are you more likely to use brown sugar or white sugar? Uh, raise your hand if you're more used to. Are you more regular? <laughs> Do you use white sugar more often? Raise your hand. Yes. Raise your hand if you think you use brown sugar more often. So the majority of the cookie recipes always call for white sugar. Some of my cookie recipes calls for brown sugar. But just about everything calls for white sugar. I don't, and if, and if it does call for brown sugar, usually calls for brown and white sugar for cookie recipes. So most of my recipes, if you're supposed to add sugar in, it's white sugar. It's rarely brown sugar. And if it is brown sugar, it also calls for white sugar as well. Okay. Well, we're not talking powdered sugar, but thank you for letting me know. Okay. There's a barrel of it over there, said Miss Harris, shaking her bangles at it. It's the only kind we have. I'll, I'll take 20 pounds of it, said Matthew, with beads of perspiration standing on his forehead. 20 pounds of brown sugar. Now, let's talk about sugar. Sugar comes white sugar. Well, I usually buy brown sugar either in a pound package or a two-pound package. If you're using brown sugar, I usually would put it on my oatmeal. Um, I might... I think I put brown sugar and apple crisp. I don't think I put white sugar and apple crisp but most of the time I think most of the sugar is white now if you buy sh white sugar you buy it by the five pound bag I think it's a two pound five pound or a ten pound bag for white sugar brown sugar it's a one pound or a two pound bag typically for brown sugar so you're more likely to use white sugar than you are brown sugar and he's asking for 20 pounds of brown sugar that's a lot 
All right. <clears throat> Matthew had driven halfway home before he was on before he was his own man again. It had been a gruesome experience, but it served him right, he thought, for committing the heresy of going to a strange store. When he reached home, he hid the rake in the tool house, but the sugar he carried in to Marilla. Brown sugar, exclaimed Marilla. Whatever possessed you to get so much? You know I never use it except for the hired man's porridge or black fruit cake. Jerry's gone, and I've made my cake long ago. It's not good sugar either. It's coarse and dark. So there's like a light brown sugar you can get, and then there's a dark brown sugar you can get in the store. Now, ours are not, not that I know of, is coarser than the other. I think it's just a matter of preference. Oh, excuse me. William Blair doesn't usually keep sugar like that. I, I thought it might come in handy sometimes, said Matthew, making good his escape. When Matthew came to think the matter over, he decided that a woman was required to cope with the situation. Marilla was out of the question. Matthew felt sure she would throw cold water on his project at once. Remained only Mrs. Lynde, for of no other woman in Avonlea would Matthew have dared to ask advice? To Mrs. Lynde, he went accordingly, and that good lady promptly took the matter out of the harassed man's hands. Pick out a dress for you to give Anne? To be sure I will. I'm going to Carmody tomorrow, and I'll attend to it. Have you something particular in mind? No? Well, I'll just go by my own judgment, then. I believe a nice, rich brown would just suit Anne. And William Blair has some new Gloria, and that's real pretty. Perhaps you'd like me to make it up for her, too, seeing that if Marilla was to make it up for Anne, would it possibly... Seeing that if Marilla was to make it, Anne would possibly probably get wind of it before the time and spoil the surprise? Well, I'll do it. No, it isn't a mite of trouble. I like sewing. I'll make it to fit my niece, Jenny Gillis, for she and Anne are just are as like as two peas as far as figure goes well now i'm i'm much obliged said matthew and and i don't know but i'd like i think they make sleeves different nowadays to what they used to be if it wouldn't be too asking too much i i'd like to make them in the new way puffs of course you needn't worry a speck more about it, Matthew. I'll make it in the very latest fashion, said Mrs. Lynde to herself, she added when Matthew had gone. It'll be a real satisfaction to see that poor child wearing something decent for once. The way Marilla dresses her is positively ridiculous. That's what, and I've ached to tell her so plainly a dozen times. I've held my tongue, though. For I can see Marilla doesn't want advice, and she thinks she knows more about bringing children up than I do. For all, she's an old maid. But that's always the way. Folks that have has brought up children know that there's no hard and fast method in the world that'll suit every child. But them as never have think it's all as plain and easy as rule of three. Just set your three terms down so fashion and the sum will work out correct. But flesh and blood don't come under the head of arithmetic, and that's where Marilla Cuthbert makes her mistake. I suppose she's trying to cultivate a spirit of humility in Anne by dressing her as she does. But it's more likely to cultivate envy and discontent. I'm sure the child must feel the difference between her clothes and other girls's. But to think of Matthew taking notice of it. That man is waking up after being asleep for over 60 years. Marilla knew all the following fortnight that Matthew had something on his mind, but what it was she could not guess. Until Christmas Eve when Mrs. Lynn brought up the new dress, Marilla behaved pretty well on the whole. Although it is very likely she distrusted Mrs. Lynde's diplomatic explanation that she had made the dress 
because Matthew was afraid Anne would find out about it too soon if Marilla made it. So this is what Matthew has been looking so mysterious over and grinning about to himself for two weeks, is it? She said very, a little stiffly but tolerantly. I knew he was up to some foolishness. Well, I must say I don't think Anne needed any more dresses. I made her three good, warm, serviceable ones this fall, and anything more is sheer extravagance. There's enough material in those sleeves alone to make a waist. Um, and the waist, wasn't that like the top part of the dress, I think? Um, I think Matthew also didn't want Marilla to make it because he was afraid Marilla would find out. Right, which is why he went to Mrs. Lind. And he asked Mrs. Lind. And Mrs. Lind was the one that came up with the cover of having, well, he asked Mrs. Lind so that Marilla didn't make it and Anne find out about it. But Matthew knew if Marilla would have done it, Marilla, first of all, probably wouldn't have done it because she said she had enough. And second of all, she wouldn't have made it in the latest, latest um, <clears throat> style. I declare there is. You'll pamper Anne's vanity, Matthew. She'll, she's as vain as a peacock now. What do you think vain as a peacock means? Well, Vane is not happy. I don't know. Not sad. So I liked what you're thinking. You're thinking of, of a peacock. So when a male peacock finds a female peacock he wants, he pulls, he let like all of his feathers get out, he puffs up and he's like, look at me, I'm Mr. S Beautiful and don't you want to have a peacock baby with me? That's what he does, right? So, so vain as a peacock means excessively proud. Excessively proud of one's appearance. Now, do you think Anne is excessively proud of her appearance right now? Because she's been embarrassed about how her clothes look. She doesn't like her red hair. She's been called carrots. She's been called skinny, right? You know, I I think being different is hard. I think I think being different is hard. I think sometimes in some people it's easier for them to be different than other people, but I think being different is hard. Um because I think human nature, we just want to kind of be like everybody else and we kind of just want to fit in and we kind of just want to go with the flow and we really don't necessarily want to stand out unless it's for something good. And I think it's really difficult when you are different than everybody else. Um, I think some people rock being different, but I think some people really struggle with being different. All right. Well, I hope she'll be satisfied at last, for I know she's been hankering after those silly sleeves ever since they came in. Although she never said a word after the first. The puffs have been getting bigger and more ridiculous right along. They're as big as balloons now. Next year, anybody who wears them will have to go through the door sideways. Christmas morning broke on a beautiful white world. It had been a very mild December, and people had looked forward to a green Christmas. So it wasn't as cold as we thought it might be, right, Christmas, or uh because she opened up the wall, you know, she opened up the windows and let let air in. So they were looking forward to a green Christmas, but it's not a green Christmas. Just enough snow fell softly in the night to transfigure Avonlea. Anne peeped out from her frosted gable window with delighted eyes. The firs in the haunted woods were all feathery and wonderful, 
The birches and wild cherry trees were outlined in pearl, and the plowed fields were stretches of snowy dimples, and there was a crisp tang in the air that was glorious. Anne ran downstairs, singing until her voice re-echoed through the green gables. Merry Christmas, Marilla! Merry Christmas, Matthew! Isn't it a lovely Christmas? I'm so glad it's white. Any other kind of Christmases doesn't seem real, does it? I don't like green Christmases. They're not green. They're nasty, faded browns and grays. What makes people call them green? Why, why, Matthew, is, is that for me? Oh, Matthew. Matthew had sheepishly unfolded the dress from its paper swathing and held it out with a deprecatory glance at Marilla, who feigned to be contemptuously filling the teapot, but nevertheless watched the scene out of the corner of her eye with a rather interested air. Anne took the dress and looked at it in reverent silence. Oh, how pretty it was. A lovely, soft brown glory with all the gloss of a skirt. A skirt with dainty frills and sh shirrings. Um, their gathers. It's kind of like, um, like ruffles you put on a dress. Yeah, so it's like decorative. A waist elaborately pin-tucked in the most fashionable way with little ruffle of flimsy lace at the neck. But the sleeves, they, they were the crowning glory. Long elbow cuffs and above them two beautiful puffs divided by rows of shirring and bows of brown silk ribbon. That's a Christmas present for you, Anne. Oh, that, that's a Christmas present for you, Anne, said Matthew shyly. Why, why, Anne, don't, don't you like it? Well, now... Well, now, for Anne's eyes had suddenly filled with tears. Like it? Oh, Matthew! She laid the dress over a chair, clasped her hands. Matthew, it's perfectly exquisite. Oh, I can never thank you enough. Look at those sleeves. Oh, it seems to me this is a, this must be a happy dream. You know, but it's kind of like if everybody has something and you're the one person that doesn't have it and you suddenly get it and you've been wanting it forever, like, you would be super happy too, right? Well, 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 let's, let us have breakfast, interrupted Marilla. I must say, Anne, I don't think you needed the dress, but since Matthew has gotten it, got it for you, see that you take good care of it. There's a hair ribbon Mrs. Lynde left for you. It's brown to match the dress. Come now, sit it. Sit in. I don't see how I'm going to eat breakfast, said Anne rapturously. Breakfast seems so commonplace at such an exciting moment. I'd rather feast my eyes on that dress. I'm so glad that puff sleeves are still fashionable. It did seem to me that I'd never get over it if they went out of they went out or went out of style before I had a dress with them. I never have felt quite satisfied, you see. It was lovely of Mrs. Lynde to give me the ribbon, too. I feel that I ought to be a very good girl, indeed. It's at times like this, I'm sorry I'm not a model little girl. And I will always resolve that I will be in the future. But somehow it's hard to carry out your resolutions when irresistible temptations come. Still, I really will make an extra effort after this. When the commonplace breakfast was over, Diana appeared crossing the white log bridge in the hollow, a gay little figure in, crim in her crimson ulster. So she's got a long, long coat, and it's made of heavy material. Anne flew down the slope to meet her. Merry Christmas, Diana. And oh, it's a wonderful Christmas. I have something splendid to show you. Matthew has given me the lovely dress with such sleeves. I couldn't even imagine any nicer. I've got something more for you, said Diana, breathlessly. Here, this box. Aunt Josephine sent us a big box with ever so many things in it. And this is for you. I'd have brought it over last night, but it didn't come until after dark. And I never feel very comfortable coming through the haunted woods in the dark now. All right. We'll have to finish. I know. Hold on. We're almost done, but we'll have to finish it later. Let's look at the questions.
Okay, one, two, and three it is. What, what, uh, what was troubling Matthew at the beginning of the chapter? That should be easy, cheesy, lemon, squeezy. Number two, what did Matthew decide to do about it? And what did he end up buying instead? There's a two parts to that question. Number three, who helped Matthew in the end and what did she say or think about it? Please make sure you're using capitalized, capitalized letters, punctuation, and complete sentences because I've noticed some people are not and I'm going to start dinging you for it. There is no reason a fifth grader should not be able to write a complete sentence. All right, talk to you later. Bye.